Walter Monk is a national treasure. He has been a guiding force, a stimulating force, a provocative force in ocean science for 75 years. When I spent a sabbatical at Cambridge, England once, I became interested in solid Earth geophysics and astronomical problems having to do with the solar system. And I received an offer to become department chairman at MIT. I thought I would accept that and follow my new interests. And Roger said, why do you have to go to MIT to do that? You could do it right here and help me establish the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Getting an opportunity from Roger to start IGPP, Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, was probably the thing I'm, I'm most proud of. And seeing that uh, institute grow and play a role in studies of geophysics all over the world, in all countries of the world, has been a very satisfying experience. I remember when I was a graduate student, um, one of the films that was shown in our physical oceanography course was Waves Across the Pacific. And there was Walter uh, in, uh, out on a tropical island in the Pacific, and they were describing uh, their studies of being able to track waves. And it's that kind of thinking that has been so uh, intrinsic to the approach that Walter has taken. Well, I think the exciting thing is that new ideas are coming up which people have not yet considered. Uh, the CO2 problem and global warming was not on the horizon of anybody's thinking. And Roger was really a leader, a unique leader in getting people to think about climate change. And he thought it was a lot of fun. He said, how very nice that human civilization has put all that stuff into the atmosphere so we can have a real experiment of seeing what that does. These are visionaries. These are people that have, you know, had visions of how the Earth was being impacted by humans, you know, a long, long, long time ago. And so these are people that, you know, are our heroes. They're the people that we look up to and sort of try to try to carry on and take things to the next step. Roger believed, and I certainly believe, two thirds of sea level rise has to do with the melting of glaciers that go out to sea, of ice sheets. Well, I think that the processes of melting at the bottom of the floating ice sheets, where they float on a relatively warm ocean, are just not understood. And I don't believe one is going to learn these by mathematical modeling. I think one is, after observing them eventually, going to be able to understand them much better. The way that waves are measured by oceanographers is, is, is actually has been being done. It's acoustics, you listen to the bubbles. That, those techniques have been being used at Scripps for many, many decades. The trick for us was actually partnering with the people who knew how to listen to the waves, knew how to listen to the bubbles, and could tell us what is a proper breaking wave, and then knowing for sure that the sea spray that's being produced is reflects what's actually in the real world. That was a big breakthrough. Four or five of us were on a National Science Foundation review panel. You know, when you sit two days and listen to usually boring proposals, and if to say they're good, they're not so good, etc. And we really needed a drink after two and a half days, and we all sat together, and somebody said, well, what would be the most interesting thing that you could do now that you would have liked to have heard. And after a few martinis, one of us, I, I, I think I'm being blamed for it, said, well, we ought to drill a hole to the, to the mantle of the earth. Nobody knows what the mantle is made of. The place that changes from the crust to the mantle is called the Mohovicic discontinuity. We shorten it to the Mohol. Well, an hour later, we made a proposal to NSF <laughs> after another drink, and it was a good one. 
we had to learn to keep a drilling ship in place when the drill string hangs down, which had never been done. And it was before the days of GPS. And we kept a ship in within one meter for a month. So that was successful. The interesting thing is that just this summer, we were invited to go and visit a Japanese drilling ship, the Chikyu. Mary and I flew out on a helicopter to the Chikyu, which is by far the most competent, scientific drilling ship in the world now. Very international, with people from all countries in the world. And they might be in a position to try and reach the mantle of the Earth within a few years. There were 15 nationalities working together, and within half an hour after you went aboard the ship, you really forgot that it was international. It was scientists from the planet Earth trying to learn about the planet Earth. Having that combination of people working together across boundaries, if you will, of the ocean with the atmosphere, chemistry with biology, with physical oceanography, this is the only place in the world that you can find that combination of people interested in those types of problems that can now work together to solve these large-scale global environmental problems. There are people across the country, around the world, who have benefited from his way of thinking, from his, uh, his generosity in, in collaboration. He's interested in sparking a discussion about what's coming next. I have a endowed chair from the Secretary of the Navy, which has given me a great deal of freedom, and they have permitted me to continue to work, and I am working, and I work today. In fact, I got something done this morning. I've been here 75 years. My loyalty is to Scripps and to UCSD and people who work here. It's, it's, it's my life.